Welcome to this wonderful video as we delve into the dark and intriguing tales of five infamous figures who left an indelible mark on history. Prepare for captivity and turmoil as we explore the lives and crimes of the. These individuals range from con artists and serial killers to complex and controversial personalities, each with their own unique story to tell. Get ready as we reveal the darker side of human nature and the profound impact these individuals have had on society. Charabo. In 1958, during the fascist dictatorship of Francisco Franco, and with the country still recovering from the Civil War, a psychopath, called Jose Maria Manuel Pablo de la Cruz Charabo Perez Morris, better known as just Charabo, managed to appear on the front pages of the newspapers, and to make the Spanish people shudder with his crimes. Charabo has just one known violent criminal operation in his historial, in which he finished with the life of four people, two men and two women, who had the bad luck to cross the killer's path. It's thought that he could have killed another people before, but it's just a theory. This case is especially important in Spanish criminal history because it was the first one in which the accused was considered a psychopath, as we know the definition of it today, and the first one in which this psychological peculiarity was used in the defense of the accused. So, the trial of Charabo was the first to create a law of precedent with psychopaths in Spain. Charabo's parents were a couple from Puerto Rico who lived in a big house in the Spain of the Civil War. Supporters of the Republican side, they ceded part of their manor to the anarchists of the CNT, who used it as their headquarters. There, a young and sentient Charabo saw repeatedly how the anarchists executed their war prisoners with a shot in the back of the neck. This must have affected the child deeply, because, when an adult, that would be his modus operandi to murder. At the end of the war, Charabo's parents fled to their native Puerto Rico with their son. There, he started the tremendous pleasure-seeking lifestyle he would carry during all his life. He married a woman called Luz Marta Alvarez Moss, but they divorced after five years, while Charabo was fulfilling a three-year penalty in a psychiatric prison in Missouri, because procurism. In this prison, in which he were put because influence of some friends, and not for having mental problems, he learned several things about mental diseases, for example, how to simulate an epileptic attack. Thanks to this he could create one of the fake identities he would use on the future years for fun, the one of a psychiatric doctor called Val Masida. When released from prison in 1950, he went back to Spain, violating his parole. The mother of the looming murderer, who used to spoil him, regularly sent vast amounts of money to him in Madrid, of which Charabo wasted every peseta, continuing with his irresponsible habits. The actor Paul Nashi, Jacinto Molina, who was famous throughout the world, was then a young halterophilic champion who used to hang out with Charabo and other friends. Charabo used to brag to them about the pace he spent his money, or about his skills of seduction. Nashi described Charabo as a natural-born seducer, capable of convincing an unknown woman to sleep with him in 15 minutes, which is specially surprising in the field of the socially and sexually strict Francoist Spain of the 50s. The actor described him as a scary man too, who one day put a 765 mm gun to his head, a gun with which he would kill years later. Molina told Charabo that it wasn't funny. Nashi saw Charabo hitting a girlfriend of his after that, and both facts were enough for him for stop seeing the man. Among all Charabo relationships with women, the one he had with Beryl Martin Jones, an English girl married with a French man, is specially important for the study of his criminal case. While they were going out together, Charabo and Beryl pawned a ring of the girl to pay for their vices. When Beryl's husband discovered that his wife had sexual relations with another man, he demanded that she return the expensive ring back, which he had given to her as a present. Then she sent several letters to Charabo asking for the prized ring. The jewel in question was at that moment in a pawn shop in Madrid, called Jusfer, where Charabo used to pawn his possessions to continue spending money in his life of luxury. The shop's owners were two men, called Felix Lopez Robledo and Emilio Fernandez Diaz. They listened to Charabo's story and accepted Beryl's letters as the owner's permission to withdraw the object, but didn't give him the ring back because he didn't have, or didn't pay, the money. Consequently, time continued to pass. One day, they told Charabo that the deadline to recover the ring had passed, so he could not get it back. 
Then, he started to plan the death of these Basinismen who dared to confront him, and to believe that they were above his will. Killing them, Chirabo could steal the ring and all the money and expensive objects they had in their store, which he thought that would be highly valued haul. After keeping watch on his future victims for a few days, he put his plan into action on the night of July 19, 1958. He went to Lopez Robledo's house when he knew that the owner and his wife were outside, so the servant, a girl called Paulina, opened the door. With his personal charm and wealthy appearance, it was easy for him to convince the servant that he was a friend of the gentleman of the house, so she let him enter. Inside, Charabo took an iron and hit the girl on her head with it, knocking her out. Then, he grabbed a knife the woman was using in the kitchen, and stabbed her in the heart, ending her life. He moved the corpse and hid in waiting for Lopez. When he arrived home after work, he was surprised because his servant didn't open the door, so he did so with his own key. When inside the house, Chirabo attacked him from behind, first pulling his jacket down to immobilize his arms, as North American gangsters used to do, and then shooting him in the nape with his 7.65mm gun, as he had seen lots of times during his childhood. With his shirt covered in blood, he waited for the wife of the dead man. When the woman arrived, Chirabo was still waiting, sitting in the living room. He told her that he was a treasury inspector, and invented a story about why her husband or the servant weren't there. The woman discovered that something was wrong, maybe because she saw her husband's blood under Chirabo's suit, and she started to run. Chirabo followed her to the bedroom, where she fell on the floor, and then he shot her in the back of the neck. He knew that the main door of the building would be closed until morning, so he decided to spend the night inside the house, in order not to appear suspicious if someone saw him trying to go out. He changed his dirty clothes for once from the wardrobe, and modified the scene to make the police believe that there had been a party there, and that the servant was sexually assaulted. Then, he carefully cleaned all the objects he thought that he had touched, for not to leave fingerprints. Later, he peacefully slept in an armchair all night long. At dawn, he left the house. It was Sunday so Jusfer didn't open that day. He spent the day going to the cinema, eating and drinking, and he left his clothes covered in blood in the dry cleaners. It's hard to understand why he did that, being a careful killer as he was, but he was really concerned about his appearance and clothes, so probably he didn't want to throw them away. The next day, early in the morning, he went to Jusfer when it was still closed and entered with a key he had stolen from Lopez. He waited in the shadows for the arrival of Fernandez Diaz, and, when he entered, Chirabo assaulted and killed him in exactly the same way as he had killed his commercial partner. Then, he searched the store, but he was disappointed about the loot he found, worth much less than he thought. He could not find the hidden safe, nor the ring he yearned for. When some time had passed, he called by phone Fernandez's partner, a woman called Angeles Mayor Martinez, and told her that he was Chirabo and that he had been calling her husband at the store but nobody had answered. He assumed that she would arrive at the store to find out what was happening, and waited in the shadows again, to kill his last victim's girlfriend. But Angelus Mayoral didn't go to the store, but the house of Felix Lopez. She called at the door but nobody answered, because everybody was dead inside. Consequently, she went back home, without giving importance to all those facts. Later, some neighbors asked her why her husband hadn't opened the shop that day, so she ran to the store, worried. There, she found her husband's corpse, and later, the crime scene in Lopez's house was discovered by the police too. Meanwhile, Chirapo had already left the place, tired of waiting, and went to leave another suit in the dry cleaners, soaked in blood and brains. When the police were investigating the crime scene in the pawn shop, in company of Angelus Mayoral, Chirabo called by phone and asked Angelus about her husband. Then, the policeman Antonio Vacura, in charge of the case, made a mental note of his name. The news of the murders were soon on the newspapers, and the worried cleaners who had Chirabo's suits called the police, giving them the name of the client and definitive proof of his guilt. Later, Chirabo arrived at dry cleaners by a taxi with two women, with whom he had planned to have a sexual trio later. The police officers were waiting there for the suspect, so they arrested him and took him to the tribunals. 
The judge decided after an intense debate that psychopathy was not a legal mitigating factor for murder, and Chiraba was condemned to death. This fact set up a very important precedent in Spanish justice. Chirabo died by the hands of a trunk executioner. Because this fact, and the strong, wide neck of Chirabo, he suffered for about 20 minutes before the collar of the Corotville finally killed him. By chance, he was the last person to be executed by this instrument in Spain. Manuel Delgado Villegas Manuel Delgado Villegas, more widely known as the Arab Hero, was a murderer and necrophiliac who was considered to be the most prolific Spanish serial killer in history, with 48 confessed victims in Spain, France, and Italy. Although only seven of those victims were demonstrated, it's believed that almost all the confessions of the Arab hero were true, or at least that he killed much more people than seven, between the late 60s and the early 70s. Delgado Villegas traveled throughout Spain, France, and Italy, and it's thought that he killed in all these places. His crimes were never related between them until he confessed. All his murders had been considered before as isolated crimes, most of them known to be unsolved. He didn't have unusual reason to kill, nor knew his victims most of the times. But the main reason for which the killings were not related was that they were very much separated in space, because the wandering lifestyle of Delgado Villegas. And not only that, but his modus operandi considerably changed from one crime to another. For not to mention that the Spanish police at the moment were not used to dealing with serial killers. His reasons to kill changed each time. Sometimes he killed for money, others for sex, and others just because of his rage. He would claim that almost everyone that he killed were homosexuals or prostitutes that were sexually arousing him before his attack. If this is a delirium he had or just a lie, we don't know, but it was not true in most of the cases. He sometimes saw himself as a hero, killing those who deserved it or who he considered that would be happier when dead. The Arab hero was born in Sevilla, in the south of Spain, on January 25th of 1943. He was the son of José Delgado Martín and Josefa Villegas Fernández, and the younger brother of Joaquina Delgado. His father Jose was a vendor of a rope, a candy made with prickly pear, which earned him and his son the Arab Piero nickname. His mother Josefa died soon after Manuel was born, because of a heart problem. The doctor had warned her that to have a second child would be fatal for her health, and he was right. Jose Delgado got married soon after his first wife died, and he went to live with his new wife in Porta de Santa Maria, in Cadiz. Manuel was left with his grandmother and his sister. Joaquina started to work as a servant in Mataro, and she could maintain their two relatives. In the childhood of Manuel Delgado Villegas we already can find some violent incidents that he protagonized. The little Manuel had a dog which he buried alive, killing it. It's very common among looming serial killers to torture and kill animals in their childhood, as he did. Probably that dog was not his only animal victim. At the age of 10, he went to school for the first time. He was thrown out soon after he opened a teacher's head with a stone. He didn't learn to read or write. Anyway, he could not, because he was a dyslexic. When he was 12, he was already working, and he gave a beating to a workmate who had made fun of him. Soon, he decided that working was not for him, and he started to look for other ways of earning money. At 14 years old, he started to work as a rent boy. But he did not only prostitute himself with men, but started to be known as a sex was among the prostitute girls, who used to give money or gifts to their beloved young Manuel. Delgado Villegas was considered to be bisexual. Sexually, the Arab hero had a physical peculiarity. He didn't ejaculate, although he felt his orgasms. Because of this, his sperm was never found on the corpses of his victims, although he had sex with lots of them. Delgado already had the impulse of traveling. Since he was a little boy he used to disappear from his grandmother's house for several days, exploring the world beyond his neighborhood. His explorations increased their duration each year. When 18, he enlisted in the Spanish Legion, where he learned the legionary strike, a karate technique with which it's possible to kill a person with one hit. The strike consists of a strong, sharp hit on the throat of the victim with the edge of the hand. 
If done right, the hit can break the victim's trachea, ending with their life immediately. Delgado Villegas used that technique lots of times during his killing spree. When he got fed up with the Legion, he simulated an epileptic attack to be put off from the military service. At this time, he had already perfectioned his simulated attacks. Each time he was arrested because some minor crime, he had a fake attack and was put into a psychiatric center, from where he fled. This time his trick worked again, and he was released from the Legion. In general, the life of Delgado Villegas since that moment was that of a wanderer, who traveled where he wanted to, earning money from prostituting himself, committing small thefts, and selling his own blood. In appearance, when an adult, the Arapiero didn't look like the dangerous serial killer he was. He was strong but short, and his face looked as that of a dumb, but not dangerous, beggar. He resembled the Mexican movie's character Cantin Flas, who was very popular in Spain at that moment, and he used to wear a mustache just like the one of the actor, proud of being like him. The Arapiero committed his first known murder when 20 years old, on January 21, 1964. He was in Garraf, Barcelona, when he saw a man, called Adolfo Fulch Montaner, taking a nap on the beach. Delgado thought that that man probably had a terrible life, and that he should help him to escape of it. He approached the man, grabbed a big stone, and hit him on the head, all of a sudden. The man died without awakening from his nap, and the only reason for it was that the Arapiero wanted to. That, and that he wanted to rob him. He was disappointed about the loot. After this murder, he traveled throughout France and Italy for about three years. During this time he worked as a hitman for the Mafia of Marcella, and probably murdered several people in both countries. The summer night of June 20, 1967, in Ibiza Island, Spain, a North American young man called Jules Morton Abramovitz befriended a girl in a pub. The girl was Margaret Helene Baudry, 20 years old, French student and artist. The American hippie invited the girl to follow him to a big house, where they could have some drugs and affection. The girl accepted. While they were starting to have fun, the girl fell asleep because of the drug use, and Abramovitz left the place. He forgot to close the door. A fatal error. The Arapiero was there, watching, and noticed his slip. Delgado Villegas went into the house with the intention of robbing it, and he was surprised when he found a nude, young girl sleeping on a mattress. He rushed towards Margaret, and when he was starting to rape her, she woke up and screamed in terror. To definitely silent the student, the Arapiero suffocated her with a pillow. He kept on having sex with her corpse when she was dead, something which used to arouse him, as a necrophiliac he was. The total control over the body of someone was what he liked, a control which, for a mind like the Arapiero's, could be only achieved through the sexual possession of their dead remains. When Delgado had finished, he slashed the girl's back several times to disconcert the police, and washed the corpse to erase his fingerprints. Some hours after the killer left the crime scene, Abramovitz went back, searching for something he had lost. The scenario at the house terrified him, and with a good reason. As the main suspect of the crime, he fulfilled more than one year in prison waiting for his trial. Finally, he was found not guilty, curiously thanks to a venereal disease he had, which demonstrated that he had not sex with the girl. The third proven crime of Manuel Delgado Villegas took place on July 20th of 1968. Walking near the town of Chinchin in Madrid, he bumped into Venancio Hernandez Carrasco, a 62 years old man. The Arapiero asked him for some food, and Hernandez told him to work and to earn his own money, alleging that he was a young and strong man. Delgado answered that he could not work because he was ill, and the man laughed at his face. This awakened the killer's fury. Delgado Villegas knocked Venancio with a karate strike on the nape, and then threw him to the Tijuana River, where he drowned. A year later, on April 2nd of 1969, in Barcelona, a man called Ramon Estrada Saladic, who was a wealthy and important man, hired the Arapiero's sexual services. They met in the office of Estrada, in the center of Barcelona. The client gave Manuel less money than the stipulated, and he refused to give him more. Delgado Villegas was not going to let it pass, so he teared out the leg of a chair, 
and used it as a weapon to give a brutal beating to Ramon Estrada, putting him in a coma from which he would now awaken. Then, the Arapiero stole money and all the most valuable but transportable objects he could find in the office, as a professional thief. Then he left. The fifth legitimate victim of Manuel Delgado Villegas died on Mataro, on November 23, 1969. Described from the killer to the police as a fantastic chick, in an attempt to look as some kind of seducer, Anastasia Barella Moreno was, actually, a 78 years old woman who was very far away from looking fantastic. Anastasia Barella was returning home from her work as a cleaner in a bar, when she bumped into the Arapiero in a deserted bridge. He wanted to rob her, and finally decided to kill the old woman. He threw her from the bridge, and she almost died from the fall. The Arapiero went down and carried her into a tunnel. The woman had died before he started raping her body. Before leaving, the killer took his time in practicing oral sex on the corpse. His two last proven crimes happened in Porta de Santa Maria. Delgado Villegas went there, where his father still lived, to help Jose Delgado with the sale of the Arope which gave both of them their nickname. Here, on December 3rd of 1970, Manuel met Francisco Marine Ramirez, a 24-year-old young man. Marine was a lonely and shy person, who could have been an homosexual interested in Delgado. For this reason or for another one, both men went around the city together on a motorbike that the Arapiero had stolen. They ended up sitting on a bridge. According to the killer's declaration, Marine tried to touch him more than once, but we don't know. The thing is that when they were sitting and after a small talk, Delgado Villegas delivered his legionary strike on the boy's throat. It killed him immediately, so when he fell off the bridge he was already dead. The sea swallowed his corpse. His last victim, for whom he was caught, was a girl from Porta de Santa Maria called Antonia Rodriguez Relink, known as Tony by the locals. She was a 38-year-old, mentally handicapped woman, with a good appeal. Antonia used to meet the truck drivers who went through the village and to have sex with them. She did it because she wanted to, but anyway some of them gave her presents and money. Manuel Delgado started a relationship with Antonia Rodriguez. He didn't love her, and probably he wasn't capable of loving anyone. But they maintained a relationship that he liked to have, he used to batter, rob and humiliate his girlfriend, and she liked him to do that. So they were a strange but happy couple, until one deadly Sunday evening. On January 18th of 1972, Delgado and his girlfriend were having sex, hidden between the bushes outside the village. When having an orgasm, the Arapiero grabbed one of the girl's pantyhoses and strangled her with it. Then, he raped the corpse. Manuel Delgado, on the following days, returned three times to the place where he had left the dead body of Tony. According to his declarations, the first two times that he went back there, he cried before the girl until he got excited and then had sex with her. The third time he visited his dead girlfriend he didn't want to have more sex with her, because the degree of decomposition of the corpse. Meanwhile, in Porta de Santa Maria, the brother of Antonia reported her disappearance to the police inspector Salvador Ortega. This police officer would be a very important person in the story of the Arapiero. The policeman first believed that Tony was with some truck driver as usual, and that she would return as always. But she didn't return, and her brother was sure that something terrible had happened to her. Porta de Santa Maria was a little village, and it was easy for Ortega and the other investigators to know that the disappeared girl had a relationship with a man from Sevilla, who went there to help his father in the work. When they saw Manuel Delgado Villegas for the first time, they didn't specially suspect him. About his girlfriend, he claimed that she should be with the truck drivers, and that he hadn't seen her for some days. Later, the police officers discovered that, just before the girl's disappearance, she had been seen arguing with Delgado Villegas, and that he had hit her during this argument. Salvador Ortega made the Arapiero turn up in his office. The inspector quickly asked Manuel about his alibi for the day of the crime, and more quickly Delgado Villegas answered that he was at the cinema that evening. Delgado already had his hand in the pocket when Ortega started to ask him for some proof of that. The suspect showed the policeman half a ticket from the cinema that day. It was a great alibi, 
but something looked really strange to the experienced inspector. Why had Delgado kept in his pocket the half ticket from days ago? Ortega called the cinema's owner and asked him for the movies that he screened last Sunday. Then, he asked the Arapiero about the movie he had seen. He related a cowboy's movie. Nothing like that had been screened that day. Ortega was interrogating him, the Arapiero saw himself trapped, and he used his best resource, an epileptic attack. Ortega still remembers today the incredible truthfulness of his acting, which fooled even the doctor of the village. This professional criminal, who many consider the greatest Spanish serial killer, was not easy to catch. But Ortega had a feeling about him. That attack was too much advisable for the man. So, he asked his superiors for putting Delgado Villegas under surveillance, and the judge allowed him to keep the suspect inside the station. When the Arapiero had recovered from his attack, he was questioned again. Finally, he confessed that he had killed Antonia. He claimed that he did it because she was unfaithful to him with the truck drivers, but probably he strangled the girl just for his own pleasure. Later, he showed the location of the corpse to the police officers. Ortega treated the Arapiero very well, he wanted to earn his trust, praising his intelligence and methods. With this, he wanted him to confess all his story. The Arapiero, who usually had been considered a retard by the people around him, was really surprised about that man who seemed to be so amazed about his intelligence. So, Ortega achieved his objective, but he never had expected what he heard during the following conversations with the man. After the murder of Antonia, he confessed another one. And then another, and another. He ended up confessing 48 crimes. Ortega then knew that he was not in front of a common criminal. During the following years, Manuel Delgado Villegas, Salvador Ortega, and another two inspectors, went all over Spain reconstructing and finding evidence on the Arapiero's seven crimes which they would demonstrate. Ortega and his workmates showed him interest for what he did, part pretended, part real, being amazed of how could such a monster be before their eyes, representing his own deadly past acts. During this time, it looks as if Ortega developed some kind of good relationship with the Arapiero. Probably it wasn't exactly friendship, but it's sure that Ortega never hated Delgado Villegas, according to his own declarations. The psychiatric reports about the Arapiero talked about him as a man with mental problems and limited intelligence who could not be fully imputable for his crimes. Ortega, among others, disagreed with that, alleging that a man of limited intelligence could not have constructed the fake alibis that he created sometimes. In 1978, the judges stayed the case and put Manuel Delgado Villegas into a psychiatric center, where he was subjected to a highly aggressive treatment with medication during almost the rest of his life. He was released in 1996, being a shadow of what he had been. He suffered from a chronic lung disease produced by the cigarettes. He died because of this on February 2nd of 1998, 55 years old. Francisco Leona Francisco Leona was a ruthless faith healer who directed the kidnapping and brutal murder of an innocent seven-year-old boy called Bernardo, in 1910. This terrifying crime brought back the legend of the Sacramenticas, and it could be the origin of another Spanish boogeyman, El Hombre del Saco, the man with the sack, who kidnaps children. It happened in a village near Almeria, called Gator. Francisco Ortega, the Morono, was then a 55-year-old man obsessed with his health, who suffered from tuberculosis, a deadly and very typical disease at that moment. He sought a solution from a faith healer, a woman called Augustina Rodriguez, who, knowing that she wasn't capable of healing his patient, put him in contact with Francisco Leona. Leona was a 75-year-old man closely related to a tyrant family who ruled Gator, so he was used to doing what he wanted and to bullying everyone with impunity since he had been a child. He was working as a barber and healer when Augustina Rodriguez put him in contact with the Moruno. It was an old and primitive common thought that the blood of children had healing properties, as did their lard. So, Leona took advantage of this, thinking that the more grotesque and hard to find the remedy was, the more his patient would be determined to pay. Claiming that his life was more important than God, Francisco Ortega accepted the quack doctor's offer. 
the family of Agustina Rodriguez was involved in the plan too, and his son, Julio Hernandez El Tonto, the dumb one, agreed to go with Leona and help with the kidnapping and carrying of the child. When they found Bernardo, who was alone, separated from his friends, Leona jumped on him and put him to sleep with a handkerchief soaked in chloroform. Then, Hernandez carried the child to a shed they had arranged for the ritual, where Augustina and the Moruno were waiting. The patient, according to the healer's instructions, had to drink the blood just when it was extracted from the child's body. Leona cut the child's armpit with a knife, and Augustina took the blood into a glass. She added sugar to the blood and then Francisco Ortega drank it. Leona sent Ortega home to wait for the second part of the remedy. Then, with the help of Julio Hernandez again, he took the child through the fields to the place where they were going to eye his corpse. Then, they killed the boy hitting his head with stones several times, and then opened his stomach and extracted the guts. Leona, being a true Sacramenticus, took the child's lard and made cataplasms with it, which later would be put over Francisco Ortega's chest as a part of the fake healing. Bernardo's parents noticed his absence soon and started a search for him on their own at first and with the help of the civil guard later. On the next day, Julio Hernandez told the civil guard that he had found Bernardo's corpse. He did it out of vengeance against his mother and Francisco Leona because they didn't pay him the 50 pesetas they had promised for helping with their plan. So, he wanted to put the civil guard on Leona's trail. Several people suspected Leona, and the civil guard arrested the old tyrant soon. He and El Tonto were interrogated, and they accused each other several times, but finally both of them confessed. Francisco Leona, Agustina Rodriguez, and Julio Hernandez were condemned to death. Julio Hernandez's penalty was finally revoked because of his psychiatric problems, and Leona died in prison before his visit to the Garoteville. Enriqueta Marti Ripal Enriqueta Marti Ripal, a name forever associated with horror and depravity, was a Spanish woman who gained infamy as a child trafficker and murderer during the early 20th century. Born in 1868 in San Feliu de Lobregat, near Barcelona, Marti's life took a sinister turn as she exploited vulnerable children for profit and committed gruesome crimes that shocked the nation. This article delves into the dark and disturbing tale of Enriqueta Marti Ripoll, her criminal activities, and the legacy of fear and revulsion she left behind. Enriqueta Marti Ripoll's early life remains shrouded in mystery. Little is known about her upbringing and the events that led her down the path of criminality. She later migrated to Barcelona where she became entangled in a world of prostitution, pedophilia, and child trafficking. Marti's heinous crimes primarily involved the abduction and trafficking of young children, predominantly girls, who were vulnerable and came from impoverished backgrounds. She preyed on their desperation and lured them with promises of a better life, only to subject them to unspeakable horrors. Many of the kidnapped children were used for prostitution, subjected to sexual abuse, and exploited by clients who sought illicit gratification. Tragically, some victims met a far worse fate at the hands of Marti. She was known to have murdered her captives, dismembered their bodies, and used their remains for her own twisted rituals and concoctions. Enriqueta Marti's reign of terror came to an end in 1912 when a young girl, Teresa Guitar Conquest, disappeared leading to an investigation that eventually unraveled her crimes. The police raided Marti's residence, known as Casa de la Rira, where they discovered evidence of her horrifying activities. The investigation revealed a gruesome scene, with human bones, bloodstains, and evidence of ritualistic practices. Shocked by the extent of Marti's crimes, the public dubbed her La Vampira del Roval, or the Vampire of El Roval, in reference to the district in Barcelona where she operated. Enriqueta Marti's trial was a spectacle that captivated the nation. She faced charges of child trafficking, murder, and various other crimes. Marti initially denied the accusations, but the evidence against her was overwhelming. She was ultimately found guilty of multiple counts of child abduction, sexual exploitation, and murder. Due to the public outcry and the heinous nature of her crimes, Marti was sentenced to life imprisonment. However, justice was never fully served. In 1913, 
while awaiting her transfer to a women's prison, an angry mob stormed the police station, overpowered the guards, and lynched Marti. Her death marked the end of her reign of terror but left many unanswered questions and unresolved mysteries. The case of Enriqueta Marti Ripoll remains a chilling reminder of the depths of human depravity and the vulnerability of innocent children. Her crimes sent shockwaves through Spanish society, exposing the existence of child trafficking and exploitation within its midst. Marti's case also prompted significant reforms in law enforcement and child protection. The investigation shed light on the shortcomings of the police and judicial system in addressing such crimes, leading to improvements in the handling of child abduction cases and the establishment of institutions dedicated to the welfare of vulnerable children. Enriqueta Marti Ripoll's dark legacy continues to haunt Barcelona and the collective. Manuel Blanco Roma Santa, commonly known as the Werewolf of Alaris, remains one of Spain's most chilling and infamous figures in the annals of crime. Born in 1809 in Galicia, northwest Spain, Roma Santa was a man with a twisted psyche, who unleashed a reign of terror upon the region during the mid-19th century. This article delves into the dark and gruesome tale of Manuel Blanco Roma Santa, his crimes, the legend of the werewolf, and the impact he left on Spanish criminal history. Manuel Blanco Roma Santa's life began innocuously enough in the small village of Reguero, Galicia. He grew up in a poor family, but by all accounts, his childhood was unremarkable. Roma Santa married and settled in Alaris, a nearby town, where he worked as a traveling vendor and eventually established himself as a tailor. However, it was during his time in Alaris that Roma Santa's descent into darkness began. According to his later testimonies, he believed he had been cursed by a witch who transformed him into a werewolf. This fantastical tale served as a chilling backdrop to his heinous crimes. Roma Santa's murderous spree commenced in the 1840s and continued for over a decade. He predominantly targeted women and young girls, preying on them in remote areas of Galicia. He would lure his victims with promises of employment or gifts, only to brutally murder them. The details of Roma Santa's killings were gruesome. He would strangle his victims, dismember their bodies, and extract their fat, which he believed possessed healing properties. Roma Santa then sold this macabre product as a remedy for various ailments, duping unsuspecting customers. It is estimated that he murdered at least 13 people, although some accounts suggest the number may have been higher. Roma Santa's reign of terror eventually came to an end when he was arrested in 1852. During his trial, he initially stuck to his story of being a werewolf, claiming that his transformation into a bloodthirsty creature was involuntary. However, his defense shifted, and he later attributed his actions to a form of insanity known as lycanthropy. The legal proceedings surrounding Roma Santa's case were highly controversial. He was initially found guilty and sentenced to death but appealed the decision. Remarkably, his sentence was commuted to life imprisonment due to doubts about his mental state. Roma Santa spent the rest of his days in prison, where he maintained his claims of being a werewolf until his death in 1863. The story of Manuel Blanco Roma Santa and the legend of the werewolf have permeated Spanish folklore and popular culture. His case captivated the nation and left an indelible mark on Spanish criminal history. The tale of a man transformed into a bloodthirsty creature both horrified and fascinated the public, sparking numerous adaptations in literature, theater, and film. Roma Santa's case also raised intriguing questions about the nature of criminality, mental illness, and the influence of superstition in the legal system. Some scholars have explored the possibility that Roma Santa suffered from a psychological disorder, such as psychopathy or schizophrenia, rather than truly believing in his mythical transformation. Manuel Blanco Roma Santa, the werewolf of Alaris, stands as a grim reminder of humanity's capacity for evil. His gruesome crimes and fantastical claims of lycanthropy have etched his name. As we conclude this exploration into the lives and deeds of Jose Maria Chirabo, Manuel Delgado Villegas, Francisco Leona, Enrique Marti Ripoll, and Manuel Blanco Roma Santa, we are left with a mix of fascination, horror, and introspection. These stories serve as cautionary reminders of the darkest aspects of humanity, the choices we make, and the impact we have on others.
By shedding light on these haunting tales, we honor the victims, both known and unknown, who suffered at the hands of these notorious individuals. Their stories serve as reminders of the importance of justice, compassion, and our collective responsibility to create a safer and more just society. Let us reflect on the profound lessons learned from these stories and use them as catalysts for change. May they inspire us to delve deeper into the complexities of human nature, to question societal norms, and to strive for a world where such darkness finds no refuge. Thank you for joining us on this captivating and thought-provoking journey through the shadows of infamy.